Wide World Special. This is Dealey Plaza in Dallas. On the 22nd day of November 1963, the President of the United States, 46-year-old John Fitzgerald Kennedy, was riding in an open limousine that was leading a motorcade heading down Elm Street, going in that direction. Sitting in the back seat alongside the President was the First Lady, Jacqueline Kennedy. Sitting in the front seat of the same open car was the then Governor of Texas, John Connolly. To his left, Mrs. Connolly. To her left, a Secret Service man. To his left, the driver, another Secret Service man. As they came down the street in the open car, they waved to the crowds on both sides of Elm. But then when they reached approximately that point, a shot rang out. We had been with the President and Mrs. Kennedy through the tour. It had been such a wonderful tour. And when we arrived in Dallas and the long motorcade, the people couldn't have been friendlier, the crowds couldn't have been more wonderful, more generous in their reaction to the president. And I just had such a good feeling about the, the way they had received him in this city. I had just turned around and said to him, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you, Mr. President. In all, at least three shots were fired. According to the Warren Commission, all three shots came from the rifle of a lone assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, a communist activist who'd set himself up in a sniper's nest on the sixth floor of that building that used to be called the Texas School Book Depository. Watch this program and then you decide for yourself whether you think Lee Harvey Oswald was acting alone. Second Generation TV News Magazine. Tonight we devote our entire show to a discussion of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, an historic event which shook the nation 11 years ago that still causes heated debate today. With our guest, Malcolm Kilduff, Assistant Press Secretary to the White House under President Kennedy, former Senator Ralph Yarborough, who rode in a Dallas motorcade one car behind the President, Jim Bishop, syndicated columnist and author of The Day Kennedy Was Shot, Mark Lane, attorney, writer, and critic of the Warren Commission Report. Dr. Josiah Thompson, former member of the Time Life Research Team that conducted its own inquiry into the assassination. And Dick Gregory, comedian and activist who has aroused new interest in the controversies surrounding that day in Dallas. I'm Don Imus, and now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the anchor man of Goodnight America, Geraldo Rivera. Good evening. Three weeks ago, during the last edition of this program, we aired the actual film of the murder of President John Kennedy. Seeing that film for the first time on network television had a tremendous impact, not only on all of us connected with Goodnight America, but evidently with a lot of you as well. Over the last three weeks, we've had thousands of letters and phone calls from people all across the country, people who wanted to know more about the assassination, people like us who wanted to know if it were more than we were told it was. Tonight we're devoting the entire program to a comprehensive review of the findings of the Warren Commission. During the course of this evening, we're going to be speaking both with people who support and who oppose its conclusions. We start at the horrible centerpiece of this 11 and a half year old controversy, the tape of our last program, and the film of the execution of the President of the United States. I'm telling you right straight out that if you are at all sensitive uh, if you're at all queasy, uh, then don't watch this film. Just 
put on the uh, the late night movie uh, because this is uh, very heavy. It's the film shot by the Dallas dress manufacturer Abraham uh, Zapruder, uh, and it's the execution of President Kennedy. And uh, Bob and Dick, would you please narrate what we're seeing as we show this film? This is uh, this is commercial footage leading into Daly Plaza. This is the car on Main Street. So this film was taken by actual newsmen. This was spliced together with the Abraham Zapruder film. Yes. All right, so this is the beginning of the motorcade. Okay, what you're seeing now is in slow motion so that you can grasp what is happening. Uh, this is a film taken by Marie Muchmore that leads into the Zapruder film. It's for time continuity. The president is waving to the crowd here. And Jacqueline Kennedy, of course, is sitting alongside him in the open car. Right. This is from Orville Nix's film. This, uh, this is originally 8 millimeter footage. And they're heading now toward Elm Street. They're on Houston Street now. They're going to make a left-hand turn. It's on the corner where they're going to make the turn there that the book depository was. Now, this is the Zapruder film. Okay, so the cars are coming along now into Dealey Plaza? Yes, th these are the lead motorcycles of the motorcade. All right, now with the President and Mrs. Kennedy is also Governor Connolly. Right. right. Now, before he goes behind the sign, the President is waving to the crowd. When he comes out from behind the sign, he is shot, and then Governor Connolly is shot. He's already been hit. He's already been hit. And now? And at the bottom of the screen, the head shot. That's the shot that blew up his head. It's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in the movies. Now, the Warren Commission said that all of the shots were fired from behind by Lee Harvey Oswald, a lone assassin, firing at the president. And as you can see, clearly, the head is thrown violently backwards, con completely consistent with the shot from the front right. Now, this is an extreme blow-up of just the president from the film. All right. Coming out behind the sign, he's shot. He's hit from, he's the, hit here. from the front, too. He's hit from, from the, the front. front. Now... Jackie doesn't realize what's happened yet. She goes to his aid. And now? He's hit Again, the violent backward motion. Totally consistent with 80% of the witnesses, which said the shot came from the grassy knoll in front and to the right. It's interesting to note how many people is running towards where most folks thought the shots came from. The head goes backwards in the next film uh, from the other side of the street. Oh, God, that's awful. I still think it's the most upsetting thing I've ever seen. Within an hour after John Kennedy had been so brutally murdered, the Dallas police arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. Henry Way, the district attorney of Dallas, was satisfied that the case against Oswald was indisputable. The circumstantial evidence was so overwhelming that D.A. Wade could, with great confidence, tell the press, I've sent men to the electric chair with less evidence. But in the shadows of the basement of the Dallas police headquarters, just 48 hours after Oswald had been arrested, something happened. ABC's Bill Lord was explaining how they were going to transfer Oswald to the Dallas County Jail. If all goes according to schedule today, Oswald will be transferred from the city jail to the county jail, which is cross town. And he will be transferred in an elevator this elevator that shuttles between the fifth floor, which is the city jail, and the basement. And when he gets to the basement, he will be placed in the sheriff's car and driven to the county jail. Can you? I can't tell you. Hey, sir, officer, officer. Yeah, he's got to be here. There he is. There he is. Here he comes. Now the prisoner uh, will run up. This I did not see, but these are the reports. There is someone down on the floor. A detective put his hand up on his forehead, uh, shaking it. Oh, no, no, this has happened. No matter how detailed and ironclad the case was of the people against Lee Harvey Oswald, and then no matter how convincing the official explanation was of what had happened, the prime suspect, the only suspect, had been silenced forever. 
Oswald had been killed and he died without ever having confessed his crime. Because of what Jack Ruby did on the 24th of November, the story of President Kennedy's assassination will always be clouded in doubt, uncertain, and suspect. This is a 6.5 millimeter Mannlicher Carcano rifle. It has a four power scope and it's precisely the same type of weapon allegedly used by Lee Harvey Oswald to kill President Kennedy. Oswald sent away for it. He purchased the weapon that killed the president for $21.45. More on the story of this rifle and on the killing and on the killing of the killer when we come back. Josiah Thompson is a professor of philosophy at Haverford College. In 1966, he worked on the independent time-life inquiry into the circumstances surrounding the death of the president. That research ultimately resulted in a comprehensive and highly technical rebuttal of the Warren Commission report. It's called, as you can see, I hope, Six Seconds in Dallas. Professor Thompson, welcome. Thank you. Uh, after your intensive investigation, what to you is the severest weakness to the Warren Commission findings that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin. The severest weakness lies at the very center of the Warren Commission case. The Warren Commission concluded that one bullet hit both Governor Connolly and President Kennedy simultaneously. That famous single bullet theory, namely that one bullet going 1,300 miles an hour slammed into the President's back on the right side, emerged from his neck, continued on to slam into Governor Con Connolly's back, very near his right armpit, blow five inches out of his fifth rib, blow a large hole out of the front of his chest, continue on to, in, to puncture his wrist bone at the, at the largest extent and shatter that bone and finally embed itself in the thigh. That theory that one bullet did all that and did it within three thousandths of a second is the greatest weakness in the Warren Commission reconstruction. Why do you say that? Because, as I remember it, President Kennedy was in the back seat of the open limousine, and Governor Connolly was in the jump seat sitting directly in front of the President. Uh, bullets traveling at 1,300 miles an hour, that much velocity can easily go through one human and through a second human. Why do you say that it's, it's improbable or impossible? Well, first off, because every witness in Dealey Plaza who spoke to the question as to which bullet hit the governor said that it occurred after the president was hit, that he was hit by a separate shot. And that, as you know, is Governor Connolly's opinion. But most importantly is this film, this crucial Zapruder film, because on that we can actually see a separate hit on Governor Connolly at least three quarters of a second after the president is already reacting to a bullet hit. All right, let's take a look at some of the individual frames from that film and make your point when you see them. All right. Now, the first frame that we have here is the Pruder frame 183. The car has not yet gotten behind the sign, hiding it from the camera. Okay. If we move in close now, I think we can see the president un uninjured, Governor Connolly uninjured, the president waving to the crowds on his right. President Kennedy is here obviously reacting to a bullet hit. His arms are upraised, his fists are clenched. But now let's look at Governor Connolly. Let's move in close on Governor Connolly. Here we see he appears quite composed. He's holding his Stetson upside down in his right wrist, a wrist which, according to the commission, has already been shattered by a bullet. He appears quite composed. It is his belief at this point that he hasn't been hit. So the president has been wounded. The governor apparently has not yet Has been. not, and that's crucial. Let's go on now. Here we have Zapruder frame 237. Now at this point, if we move in close, I think, on the governor, we can see that his mouth is open. He said that just when he was hit, and his wife said just before he was hit, he was yelling, oh, no, no, no. I think he's yelling that just now. Now the hit occurs right now in the next 1 18th of a second. Let's go to the next frame. You see the change, the remarkable change. His shoulder has been driven down by the impact of the bullet. His cheeks have been puffed as the air has been forced up through the epiglottis, expanding the cheeks, and his hair has been mussed. That's what Dr. Gregory, Connolly's doctor, told me when he saw that. Now let's move on to the next, 239. Connolly's face is distorted like a boxer's face under the impact of his opponent's blows. His, his hair is mussed as before. Let's move on to the next frame, 240. Again, pretty much the same effect. 
Now, for the first time in this frame, we can see that shattered wrist begin to give way. But it, occur it begins to give way only after the hit at 237, 238. I want to stress what a small time that is. One eighteenth of a second. All those considerable changes occurred. So you say that Governor Conley was hit after the president was wounded? At least three quarters of a second after and perhaps up to one and a half seconds later. But most of the witnesses, and certainly the Warren Commission's conclusion, say that there were three shots. Why couldn't it have been Lee Harvey Oswald firing once, wounding the president with that first non-fatal shot? Lee Harvey Oswald firing again and wounding Governor Conley with that second shot, and then only the third shot being that horrible headshot blowing off the top of the president's head. A good question, Mr. Rivera. And if Lee Harvey Oswald had been using a machine gun, he could have done that easily, but he wasn't using a machine gun. He was using this carbine. Notice how it works. Now, the FBI tested this gun. They got Agent Robert Frazier, the fastest gun they could find, and he fired many, many rounds from this rifle. And what they wanted to find out was, what was the minimum mechanical time necessary to pull the trigger, work the action, and pull the trigger again, without aiming. I stress that, without aiming. The fastest time, the fastest time in all these tests that Bob Fraser could manage was 2.3 seconds. Now, we're dealing with, a, with two hits within at least, at maximum, a second and a half. So you're saying that the time that passed between the time the president was wounded and the time the governor was wounded was just too short for Oswald to get off two shots. Exactly. That sounds convincing to me, but first I think it's instructive and interesting to see that Governor Conley agrees that he and the president were not hit simultaneously. We have a film clip from a press conference the governor had, and we'll show it now. That the first shot that was fired hit the president. The second shot that was fired hit me. The third shot that was fired hit the president. But I know I wasn't hit with the first shot. And then I was hit. And I know I wasn't hit with the third shot. That much I'm absolutely sure of. Let's assume for a second, as the Warren Commission evidently did, that the governor was wrong under the, the traumatic uh, uh, experience of being wounded so severely, he simply mixed, was mixed up in his facts. And that every other witness who spoke to him was And that every other witness up. was yes. mixed up. Is it possible that the governor experienced a delayed reaction? Uh, and if it is, is it possible, uh, physically speaking, for Lee Harvey Oswald to fire a single bullet and to have that bullet go through the president's back, out his neck, into the back of, of the governor, the same bullet. I don't think it is, and I think we can show it right here. But I think it's important to show that we've exactly marked the models as, in fact, the wounds were incurred on Governor Connolly and President Kennedy. All right. How do we know that, first of all? First of all, we have President Kennedy's coat. It exists, and we have a photograph of it. And one can see on that coat, about four inches down from the collar, a bullet hole here. We also have his shirt. And that also shows a bullet hole in the same position. We have notes that were taken during the autopsy, and a sketch of President Kennedy's body is drawn during the autopsy. At point B on this sketch, if we move in closely, we can see it now. There's a bullet wound, measures seven by four millimeters, and again, it matches up with this position. In addition, we have the front of President Kennedy's shirt, which, which shows a small nick a small slit in the shirt just under the collar button at approximately this location. That then marks the trajectory through the president. And we have here, I believe, a view drawn by a Warren Commission artist of that trajectory. Note, of course, that on the Warren Commission sketch, the wound has been moved to this position. It's moved higher than it appeared initially. Yes, and there's some dispute about that. This seems to me to be the proper location. Now, moving on to Governor Connolly, I think we can see it clearly on the right-hand side of the screen, a hole here. That establishes then the entry point of the bullet, which then emerged about four inches under the right nipple of Governor Connolly. Okay. Now, draw the trajectories and, and make your argument. We have a right-to-left trajectory of about 20 degrees here, entering here and emerging on the midline. Now, it should be obvious that a bullet that emerges on that trajectory would just barely graze Governor Connolly's left arm. 
in order for it to enter at this point, just under his right armpit, the bullet would to have, have to have turned around in midair, moved over two feet, and then driven downward at a much sharper trajectory to emerge at the point it did. Uh, well, prima facie, it seems improbable that the bullet emerging here would then go over there. But again, what if somehow Oswald had miraculously managed to do it? What if the president, for instance, well, had been waving to the audience, the people on that side of Elm Street, and had leaned way over, excuse me, Mr. Roth, and that Governor Conley at the same time was waving to the crowds all the way over here on this side of Elm Street. Well, Is we'd, it have, possible we'd to have to it? move them even farther here. <clears throat> Okay, that will do it. Now, it is possible by very awkwardly changing the models to get a trajectory like that, which will line up in the horizontal plane, but of course not in the vertical plane. But the problem there is that we have the Zapruder film. And on the Zapruder film, we can see what happens up until the car goes behind the sign. There's just three quarters of a second there where it's hidden. In that three quarters of a second, for this to have occurred, they would have had to have moved from their normal position, which they had before it went behind the sign, and then awkwardly stressed themselves like this, been hit by the bullet, and then moved back to the normal position, where we find them just three quarters of a second later. That boggles my imagination. How central is this single bullet theory to the Warren Commission's findings that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone? It is absolutely central. As the Commission Counsel Redlick put it, to say that they were hit by separate shots is to say that there was more than one assassin. What happened to the bullet that passed through these men? Oh, we have the bullet. We have the bullet. It exists in the National Archives. We even have a photograph here of the bullet. I'd like to show you that bullet. This is the bullet right here. Notice the rifling grooves. Right. It appears basically undamaged. The end is a bit squeezed, a bit of lead extruding from the end. Now this but is the actual bullet that the Warren Commission offered as its exhibit, uh, as the bullet that passed through both the President and the Governor. This bullet went through President Kennedy, hit Governor Connolly, blasted five inches out of his fifth rib, continued on to shatter his radius and embed itself in his thigh, according to the Warren Commission. It doesn't look like it's been damaged by the it, passage. It looks like a virtually perfect bullet. Now here are three bullets. The bullet we just looked at is in the center. This and is the actual bullet that they found. That's the actual bullet, the bullet that was supposed to have done all this. On either end are ballistic comparison bullets that were fired into cotton by the FBI. These went into cotton. According to the commission, this went through two people, smashed two large bones, and it looks virtually undamaged. The commission actually performed experiments to see what would happen to bullets fired from Oswald's rifle when they hit bone. That's a bullet fired from Oswald's rifle that was fired into a, a corpse's wrist, grossly deformed as one would expect. All these bullets that hit anything were grossly deformed. And yet this bullet allegedly went through two people and smashed two large bones. And I submit that that's just profoundly improbable. Is that your conclusion then? Not only my, my conclusion, but I think the conclusion of any forensic expert who has looked at these bullets and looked at the case. Okay. We'll talk to people, of course, who are of the opposing point of view later on in the program. Dr. Thompson, thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. On November 22, 1963, the sad duty of informing America that the president had been shot and killed fell on the shoulders of Malcolm Kilduff, the assistant White House press secretary, who was ironically acting as head press secretary on that Dallas trip because Pierre Salinger was flying to Japan. Kilduff later served under President Johnson, and he's now doing public relations work in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Malcolm Kilduff. And welcome to you, sir. I wonder if you could just give us uh, exactly your location at the instant uh, the president was shot. My location was sitting in the, Here. basically in the fourth car in the motorcade, in the right front seat with Merriman Smith of the United Press. It was the press pool car. I started uh, in the previous segment by asking Dr. Thompson what he thought the single greatest weakness of the Warren Commission report was. I want to ask you what you think the, the single strongest aspect of that report is. Well, I think that the, the Warren Commission did its job and did its job well. Uh, I must frankly admit 
that I wonder why some of us who were that close to it were not interviewed by the Warren Commission. You mean the Warren Commission never called you? No, they did not. What did you see and hear? And Basically, uh, what the doctor said, I would have to support. There was enough time, Merriman Smith sitting in the middle of the car, there was enough time after we heard the first shot for Merriman Smith to say to me, what was that? And for me to say, it sounded like a firecracker. You time that out, it comes out to about three and a half seconds. And I can remember very clearly, and I don't know why I can remember it clearly, but I do. It was getting near Christmas time, and in Texas, uh, Senator Yarbury will tell you they use firecrackers, and I figured somebody had thrown a firecracker out. It was an immediate thought, and I can remember it as if it were yesterday, that that was my immediate thought. It was a firecracker. Now, there was enough time in there between the first and the second shot. In the reconstruction of the motorcade, as we were coming into Elm Street, our car was directly under the window in the Texas School Book Depository. There is no question in my mind, and I'll be very clear about this, as to where those shots came from, because they were coming right into my right ear. And as we were turning that corner, that was the car that, in point of fact, was the closest to the rifle at the time it was discharged. That rifle in that window just above my right shoulder. So you're saying that, that to you, unequivocally, the bullets came from the school book depository and not, as some people say, from the front or from the Three side? Three shots came from the same location within that period of time. They sounded precise, exactly alike. They came from the same location. If they had come from far ahead, I would not have heard it that clearly because we were not in a convertible. The press pool car was a closed Southwestern Bell telephone car that had, uh, had a phone in it. It was just a normal sedan. So if it had come from forward of the motorcade, as some experts have suggested, that shot would not have been that clear. They were all of the same in intensity to me at that precise moment in time. Do you agree? with the central finding of the Warren Commission that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin. Yes, I do. Do you agree that one bullet passed through the president and then went on to wound Governor Conley? No, I believe it was the second shot that hit Governor Conley. Would you object to a reopening of the Warren Commission or some other official body? No, I certainly would not uh, object to a reopening of the Warren Commission report. I, I think that there's been far too much mystery uh, made of this too too much talk of this of this conspiracy uh, for I I do strongly feel that it was the single act of a single deranged mind of Lee Harvey Oswald and one of the reasons he got away with it was because he told no one he didn't brag about it at a local bar or anything else because Prior you've got to, to yeah. yes because you've got to remember the, the Secret Service and having served in the White House for over three years I know this receive letters every day from cranks. They're going to kill the president. Well, this happens every day, and they get reports, and they look into them every day. He just happened to keep his mouth shut and just went about his business the way he wanted to and did, did exactly what he had planned on doing. So although, in summary, although you feel that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, you have no objection to a reopening of the inquiry to no, clear No, because I would, like to see, I would like to see the doubts laid to rest. Very definitely, I'd like to see the doubts laid to rest. With us is one of the... Uh, prime reasons that we are doubtful now. Mark Lane, who was an early and outspoken critic of the report, a fact which immediately made him famous or infamous, depending on whose point of view you have. Uh, Mark, welcome. Thank you. Uh, what to you are the, the most important unanswered questions? And uh, how do you respond to Mr. Kilduff's feeling that uh, because he was there and he heard the shot so clearly that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin. Well, I think it's a shame that the Warren Commission, uh, which had uh, some 25,000 interviews and reinterviews conducted by the FBI, 1,550 interviews conducted by the United States Secret Service, published 26 volumes of evidence, a massive amount of material locked away in the archives and in the files of the FBI and the CIA, never questioned this witness. Uh, one wonders how they filled up their volumes. I'll give you an example. What they thought more relevant than Mr. Kilduff's testimony was the dental chart showing the condition of Jack Ruby's mother's teeth in 1938, which, I which they published in full in volume 18, which I suggest would not have been relevant had it been charged that Ruby bit Oswald to death. <laughs> but I don't know why Mr. Kilduff, I don't know why Mr. Kilduff says they did such a good job. 
they didn't question 98% of the eye and witnesses to the assassination of John Kennedy. I know why they didn't question Mr. Kilduff. Why? Because if he said what he said here, it would prove the Warren Commission report was incorrect. There's not, I think, an adequate job in terms of the doubts which exist in this country, which proliferate in this country, which I believe are held by the majority of people in this country now, more than a decade after the death of President Kennedy. All right. We'll talk more about that when we come back in a minute. Bishop began his 45-year career in journalism as a copyboy for the New York News. He advanced through the ranks as a reporter, rewrite man, feature writer, magazine editor, and author of dozens of books, including this one. It's called The Day Kennedy Was Shot. Today, Mr. Bishop is a syndicated columnist and contributed to many national magazines, and he's here tonight as one of the Warren Commission's staunchest defenders. Mr. Bishop, welcome. Thank uh, you, sir. I know you spent five years researching that book, The Day Kennedy Was That's Shot. Uh, what's new? Now, the newest thing on that subject is a little piece of literature from Medical Times, November 1974, which is fairly recent. And I don't know whether you can pick this up on a camera, but it tells about the Kennedy, Kennedy Connolly one bullet theory. Right, the single bullet theory. And the men who were assigned to go to Bethesda first, before they went to the National Archives, uh, managed, it seems here, to see the x-rays that Mark Lane and I have been talking about the years and trying to get the government to show to the world. Right. The, I should make that point that the autopsy of the president, which would really be the definitive uh, evidence as to many of these theories, uh, has been not generally available, uh, either well, the X-rays or the autopsy. As you know, who is the uh, Army forensic medical expert, was the man who presided that night in Bethesda over this thing. And the Gawler brothers were the funeral directors, and I interviewed them on each shot, type of shot, where it was, where they had to patch up the president's head, even where they found the hair to match his hair. And I just want you to... I, I saw your reconstruction with two men sitting in chairs, one behind the other, and right. I want you to read this from the mouth of Governor Connolly. Quote, and this is part of this Medical Times. We had just made the turn. Well, when I heard what I thought was a <clears throat> shot, I heard this noise, which I immediately took to be a rifle shot. I instinctively turned to my right because the sound appeared to come from over my right shoulder. So I turned to look over my right shoulder and I saw nothing unusual except just people in the crowd. But I did not catch the president in the corner of my eye and I was interested because once I heard the shot in my own mind, I identified it as a rifle shot. The only thought that crossed my mind was that this is an assassination attempt. So I looked, failing to see him. I was turning to look back over my left shoulder into the back seat, this way. But I never got that far in my turn. I got about in the position I am in now, facing you, looking a little bit to the left of center, and then I felt like someone had hit me in the back. Now, this is entirely consistent with the one bullet theory through the strap muscles below the, the neck and adjoining the shoulder, and the tumbling action is attested to in the medical report that the wound found in the back of the president's neck was perfectly round, but the one found in Governor Connolly's chest was elongated, which means that the bullet, instead of flying straight, had hit some obstruction and started to tumble. And in its tumbling action, it caught the governor this way, lengthwise. As a matter of fact, by the time it splintered through the rib cage and Connolly's hand was like this as he tried to look back, it went into his wrist and then into his thigh. And in each case, it was a tumbling motion. This is why the bullet was found probably on the stretcher or fallen off the stretcher when he was taken to Parkland Memorial Hospital. This also accounts for the very slight, almost abrasive wound in the thigh. If you're hit by a bullet, you're not going to end up with a very slight abrasion. It's going to be a fairly good one. And the shattered wrist. 
These could all be accomplished by this particular rifle, which had a muzzle velocity of 1,905 feet per second. We do not use carbines of that strength in the United States Army. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, the first one concerns the apparently delayed reaction of the governor with a rifle that you say uh, has a muscle velocity that fast. Wouldn't the governor respond on the film instantaneously to, to that a shot, shot if it were the same shot? No one, no one responds instantaneously to a shot unless a, a, a strong nerve has been hit and it's a reflex action. Why is the president reacting seemingly instantaneously? His hands are going up, his fists are clenched, he looks very obviously like a man who's been hit when the governor doesn't react until at least three quarters of a second later. And yet, now you're talking about reaction time. You must concede this, that when the president heard that first shot, we will never know, but we may assume that he thought it was a shot. Because three weeks before, I was in the White House with him, uh, doing the final interview on a book called A Day in the Life of President Kennedy, and he brought up the subject of assassinations. I didn't. And he said that he subscribed to what Lincoln believed in, and that is if there's anyone high enough and he has a gun, Jim, there's no way they can protect you. He can get you. Now, if he believed this, and if he heard what he thought was a sharp retort and he was waving to people, wouldn't it be almost instinctive that he would go like this? And also, isn't it quite possible that Connolly was a little bit slower in turning to the right because he heard the sound coming from that direction? Well, basically what we have, I think, is that the witnesses are wrong, the film is wrong, the forensic evidence is wrong, and the ballistics are wrong. This is the forensic evidence. Well, Dr. Cyril Weck is a forensic pathologist, and he'll be here. I don't really want to go into the forensic evidence, although I'd like to. But so can what's I your summary, Jim? My summary is that the Warren Commission was correct. And the only mystery we have left is a thing that, uh, that Mac and I have discussed and we, we're not agreed upon, and that is, was there a number one bullet which missed the car through the U of the tree? Or was that a third bullet? So you're saying know. that there was three bullets. The first bullet missed. missed. The second bullet did go through Bottom. the president and, and then, then through the governor. Right. The governor was wrong in his testimony, essentially, is what you're saying. No, no, no. He, he was wrong, yes, but honestly wrong. Yeah, sincerely I'm not wrong. saying. Yes, I'm not. He wasn't lying. Right. The governor was sincerely mistaken. But, but if the... you listen to the quotes from him right after it happened, he turned to his right as he would. If you heard a shot coming from there, you would turn, too. And then the, right, the left hand goes on to the right leg. And when he turned the other way, he was in the opposite frame. You're on a jump seat. Right, but what about the fact that the bullet that they found allegedly on the stretcher of Governor Conley had only four grains missing from it, and a bullet that passed through one man's back, out his neck, did this tumbling act that you suggest, went into the back of Governor Conley, smashed his rib, knocking the rib out, mm -hmm. and smashed the wrist bone, which as I understand is one of the thickest bones in the body, yes, embedding itself someplace in the thigh, or at least mm -hmm. wounding the thigh. Uh, the damage you mean was so the insignificant. The grain should have been missing? No, uh, I'm these saying that the bullet should have been flattened or in, in some way These gentlemen deformed. postulate that it's quite possible that by the time it, it went through Governor Connolly, the bullet may have reversed itself in its tumbling and been traveling back to the front while going in this direction. In other words, you fire and a bullet tumbles end over end and hits you and goes through your skull. It explodes the skull. Five and a quarter inches of the president's head flew out over the back of the car. Uh, it has an explosive tumbling effect. All right, well, let's see. So wait, just before, we, just before we go away for a commercial, and we'll be right back. You're saying that the bullet turned in midair and went into Governor no, Conley. after hitting the president. Right, after it hitting the president. It started to tumble. It tumbled, so it went in backwards, and that's why it's not. No, it, in his back, it went in sideways, this way, the long way. Right. And the wound and, and the scar that the governor carries today is elongated. It is not round. Okay. I wonder if I can just say one thing, and that is Lieutenant Colonel Pierre Fink, we referred to, yes. who in fact was in charge of the autopsy at Bethesda, testified that there are more grains of metal in Governor Connolly's right wrist than are missing from that bullet. Now, whether it went in backwards or sideways or inside out, when you come to the weight, if there are more grains left in the wrist than are missing from the bullet, that bullet could not have contributed all of those grains. 
If Dr. Fink said that, yes, then I would subscribe to what you say, but I haven't read it or heard him say it. He testified to it. Uh -huh. We'll check that well, I have all when we're during the commercial break, whether he said it or not. As we were leaving, you said that there were more grains of lead found in the governor's wrist than could have come from that bullet, they say. I said Lieutenant Colonel Pierre Fink testified to that. This is volume two of the Warren Commission's evidence, of page 382. It's the question of Colonel Fink by Arlen Specter, and he is asked, Mr. Specter asks Colonel Fink if he has examined, had an opportunity to examine Commission Exhibit 399, which is that bullet, and he says yes, he has been able to do that this afternoon. And then he's asked if, uh, and could it have been the bullet which inflicted the wound on Governor Connolly's right wrist? Answer by Colonel Fink, no, for the reason that there are too many fragments described in that wrist. This is a report of government-sponsored panel of forensic pathologists, Dr. William H. Corns, Dr. Russell S. Fisher, Dr. Russell H. Morgan, radiologist, and Dr. Alan R. Moritz, National Archives, Washington, D.C., 1968. And they say that... And they all agree, even though they will not identify which ones of them were opposed to the Warren Commission theory, they admit in the, at the start that some of them were opposed to it and didn't agree with it. But now, they are in unanimous agreement that there were three bullets one somehow missed the car, one hit the president and the governor, and one killed the president. Uh, and this is November 1974. It, it does, however, in this volume two of the Warren Commission report, seem to indicate that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fink does not feel that the bullet 399 was the bullet that fractured the wrist. Uh, of course, he could be mistaken, as could many, many other people. That's why we're here, is because it's very difficult to believe any thesis all the way. I found it difficult myself to write the book because, uh, as I told you, I could have gone wild, talked of conspirators, and made, I think, a, perhaps a better selling book out of it. Do you have any objections personally to a reopening of the inquiry? None whatever. None whatever. Uh, I think uh, anyone will agree that uh, we could have cleared the whole thing up at that time had two things happened. One is, had Lyndon Johnson not ordered the Warren Commission to hurry it up and give me a complete report, that was point one that was harmful. And point two was, Mrs. Kennedy, the widow, felt that the x-rays and the other medical material were sacred and were to be kept secret from the world for something like 75 years. Now, if we hadn't had those two things, then anyone could have walked in and examined it as public material. Well, there's a lot of other evidence which has been locked up in the National Archives and the files of the CIA and the FBI. It had nothing to do with the request by the Kennedy family. And I'm glad to see, that, Jim, that you take the position the matter should be reopened. I think most Americans feel that way. I spoke in Madison, Wisconsin yesterday. At this, yesterday, uh, after I spoke there about the case, the Attorney General of that state, Bronson LaFollette, the mayor of Madison, Paul Soglin, called for, called upon Congress to reopen it, and said they personally, I think, were reflecting the feelings of millions of Americans when they said they would not be satisfied with a new presidential commission or a commission which relies upon the CIA or the FBI to conduct investigation. But what they wanted, and I think what most Americans want, is an investigation by a committee of Congress not conducted the way the Warren Commission did, all behind closed doors, all in secrecy, and finally with their report being issued, but conducted the way Urban's investigation of Watergate was conducted before the American people. This was, after all, something which affected the lives of every person who lives on this planet. And today, 11 years later, because of the actions of the federal government and the federal police, the American people still don't know why John Kennedy was killed or who killed him. And I think this matter remains on the agenda until we get those answers. We have to go to a commercial now. Thank you both, Malcolm and Mark, for coming on. Jim, stick, stick in for a little while. Okay, we'll be right back. We've been joined by Dr. Cyril Wecht, who's a certified forensic pathologist. He's the coroner of the city of Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. 
In addition to that, he's also a professor of law and pathology. He's formerly the president of the American College of Legal Medicine, and he's now the director of the Institute of Forensic Scientists. He's one of a handful of physicists, or physicians, I should say, who've seen, actually seen the autopsy photographs and x-rays of uh, the late president. Uh, welcome, Dr. Weck. Now, Thank you. Before I get into the questioning, I want to make one thing clear before we go on. Uh, it's, the, it's the question of the single bullet theory. Uh, briefly, to summarize, if the President and Governor Conley were wounded by two separate bullets, that leads uh, uh, to the conclusion that there were two assassins because of the difficulty in operating that rifle. If, in fact, they were hit by the same, by the same bullet, by a single bullet, that leads great weight to the Warren Commission's finding that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I'm not going to ask you about that yet, but we'll get to that. First of all, to establish your credentials, if any establishment is necessary, other than reading your resume, how many autopsies have you performed? I have performed around 7,500 autopsies and have directed, supervised, or reviewed perhaps another uh, 10,000 over the past 18 years or so. How would you characterize the autopsy performed on President Kennedy? as one of the most incomplete, superficial, incompetent medical legal autopsies that I have ever seen. Let me say, without any reference at this point, to what one believes about the conclusions of the Warren Commission, there is no question at all among forensic pathologists and other forensic scientists that this autopsy is absolutely unbelievable. That this should have been done in the United States of America on the most important medical legal autopsy in the history of our country and possibly in the world in this fashion still staggers the imagination and after all these years I find it hard to believe that it did happen. The pictures of that autopsy. Of course if the autopsy had been scientifically uh, adequate this obscene speculation that's been going on about the president's body would uh, have been silenced. Uh, we can't redo the autopsy, uh, but there were photographs taken and x-rays, and you're one of the few people who are given access to those documents. The documents show many things, many things which are set forth in the autopsy report. Uh, I do find many things with which I agree. There are a lot of things that are not in controversy. The more important things, perhaps, Mr. Rivera, are the items that are missing from the National Archives. And this is something that, unfortunately, too many Americans don't know. They have no way of knowing. The President's brain was not buried with the body. It was quite properly saved, placed in formalin to be fixed so that it could be examined two weeks later. You see, in a fresh, traumatized state, it would literally fall apart in your hands, and you could not trace the tracks of the bullets or bullet fragments. You fix it in formalin, and then you go back two weeks later, and you serially section it, and then you get a classic demonstration of the pathways of a bullet or bullet fragments. On December 7th, 1963, the pathologist did go back to the brain, and it is so listed in a supplemental report in the 26 volume set. And the final sentence regarding the brain says, coronal sections, that's side to side, coronal sections of the brain are not made in order to preserve the specimen. Okay? They don't say for whom, but it wasn't for me, because the brain is no longer there at the National Archives. The microscopic tissue slides which were made of the so-called wounds of entrance and the so-called wounds of exit, which may or may not be exit and entrance as they believe. Those slides, which they do refer to in their supplemental autopsy report, are no longer at the National Archives. Special sections made of the brain are no longer at the National Archives, and codochromes of the interior chest of the president so that we could learn more about the wounds, the wounds of the neck, the wounds of the back, the trajectory of the bullet, et cetera, what structures might have been damaged, those codochromes are missing. So probably the four most important items of hard, physical, forensic pathology evidence regarding the autopsy on the President of the United States are missing. Where'd they go? No, who, who they're, very, they're very, very clever, you see. They don't get themselves into a Watergate bind. They don't say that they have been lost they don't say that they are destroyed, and they don't say that you can't see them. They simply say, we do not know where they are. We've been talking about the single bullet theory, the bullet going through the president to the governor. What about that headshot 
I want to show the film again from Zapruder's frame approximately 312 onward. We've talked about the first two shots. Let's talk about that last shot because I think in the last program we put undue emphasis on the fact that the president's head was whipped back. So at the risk of, uh, of horrifying you again, I want to show that, that film. So the president, there's the head shot. The head blows off and the, hesitant, the president's head goes violently backward. Uh, there's the backward motion. Now, in the last program, everyone who saw it and everyone who saw it at home all said that the bullet appeared to come from the front, and that's why the head was whipped back that way. Uh, but I understand that that may not have been the case. It may, it may not have been the case. The only thing I can say to that from a forensic pathology standpoint is that the movement of the body is much more consistent with a shot coming in much further down on the side than the alleged sight of Lee Harvey Oswald or anybody else from the southeast corner of the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. I cannot, however, say that it is a physical impossibility for that shot to have been fired from the but rear. But it uh, still could have come from the rear. Yes, it is a possibility that I certainly would, would not rule out and cannot rule out. Okay, so uh, I think that opponents of the Warren Commission really do have to rest their case on the single bullet theory. Well, there are some other things. May I point these out? They're very I'm, important. We, we don't have a lot more time. What could be better? for the government. What could be better for Mr. David Bellin and Mr. Arlen Specter and Mr. Kilduff and Mr. Bishop than to get these pieces of scientific evidence released? Let's get in top flight forensic scientists, men of the finest reputation. Get them to review and analyze these things. Get the brain, get the slides privately, not for the front cover of Time magazine or to show on a television program, but done in a very precise scientific fashion. Let's see what the hard physical evidence points out. Mr. Kilduff said before that 11 years have gone by and it's too late to do anything. No, you see, Mr. Kilduff means well, but he doesn't have the training in forensic sciences. The evidence of neutron activation analysis, spectrographic analysis, looking at microscopic sides under the microscope, it could be 110 years old and we can still learn things from it. Let's all of us join together, get this physical evidence, and then we'll see where we are. I know today two people shot the president and Governor Conley on November 22nd, 1963, because under the single bullet theory alone, having destroyed it, we arrive inevitably, inexorably, and irrefutably to the conclusion that two human beings did the shooting on that okay, day. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bishop, thank you for being here, and Dr. Wick, thank you. Uh, I'm very grateful to be in good company. Well. After nearly 14 years in the United States Senate, Ralph Yarborough is currently practicing law in his home state of Texas. On that fatal day in Dallas, Senator Yarborough was in the car with the Johnsons, following right behind President Kennedy's car. And he's here with us tonight to give us an eyewitness account, perhaps the best eyewitness account of what happened. It wasn't in the immediate car behind the President. There was a Secret Service car between the President's car and the Johnson car. And uh, we had proceeded westward on Main Street, and between very tall buildings, enthusiastic crowds on each side. I would look up in the high-rise buildings, some of the same enthusiasm, but some of the looks in the high-rise buildings were definitely hostile. And I began to worry before we got to the end of uh, Main Street, out past the courthouse, thought of how easy it'd be for some kook or nut to drop a flower pot in the president's car with the president, Miss Kennedy. So when we got to the end of Main Street, past the courthouse with the open green sward before us leading down to the underpass, I felt a great sigh of relief. But then we turned uh, northward on Houston and went a block, and then you had to do almost a U-turn to get around on Elm, and everything slowed up. And as we started down Elm Street at a very, very slow pace, I heard a rifle shot. And then after three seconds measured this way rather than by a clock, one, two, three, there was a second blast. And then about one and one and a half to two, a third blast. Well, with the first blast, 
the immediate uh, thought that went through my mind, that's a rifle shot. Well, I've hunted a lot all my life, and in the infantry with the 97th Infantry Division in World War II, I qualified with carbines, rifles, pistols, bazookas, and machine guns. I've fired guns a lot. After the first shot, though, I was puzzled. Now, I didn't consciously think this out. An emergency like that, you don't have time to stop and think. Thoughts take over. The thoughts from past recollection recorded or past experiences in life take over with the brain. You just don't have time in two or three seconds to sit there and reason things out. Thoughts took over. They ran through my mind. That's a rifle shot. Why are we stopping? Why is this slowed up? What's happened here? And then I smell gunpowder and I thought, well, could I be mistaken about that being a rifle shot? Because normally if you're firing a rifle, you don't smell gunpowder unless you're shooting something upwind and it blows it back in your face. And I didn't understand smelling gunpowder. And then after the second shot, briefly after that, they took off. But the motorcade did not take off till, the time, till about the time the third shot was fired. A period of at least five, six, seven. About five minutes. seconds. In retrospect, it looks to me like uh, something you go back to the ancient Greek, the fates of great Greek tragedy. Here's President Kennedy. That first shot would topple the normal man over, I believe, from my experience in life and seeing wounded men in the battlefield. And it would have toppled a man over. It didn't topple him. Why? He had that corset on. I've been in President Kennedy's dressing room uh, and saw that corset strapped way up here when he was dressing, while he was president. And here was a corset from that back illness and injury held him up till an assassin could kill him. And the car stopped. Everything went wrong. Nothing went right. It looked like all the fates were against him that day. What about the, the finding of the commission that Oswald was Well, when I wrote them, you see, they came over then, a couple of uh, fellows to see me sometime after that, and they walked in like uh, they were a couple of deputy sheriffs, and I was a bank robber. They caught me walking out. What do you got to say about this? I didn't like the attitude. As a senator, I felt insulted. And they went off and wrote up something, brought it back for me to sign that I refused to sign. I threw it in the drawer and let it lie there for weeks. And they had on the last sentence on there to swear to it, this is all I know about the assassination. They wanted me to sign this thing, then say, this is all I know. Of course, I would never have signed it. Finally, after some weeks went by, they began to bug me, you're holding this up, you're holding this up, and uh, demanding that I sign a report. So I typed one up myself and put basically what I've told you about how the cars didn't take off. And I said in there, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but for the protection of future presidents, uh, they should be trained to take off when there's a shot fired. And uh, I sent that over, and that's dated uh, July the uh, 10th, 1964, after the assassination. To my surprise, when the volumes were finally printed and came out, I was surprised at how many people down at the White House didn't file their affidavits till after the date after that of mine, the 10th of July, I waited to see what I was going to say before they'd file theirs. I, I began to lose confidence then. That's further eroded with time. Uh, about two weeks ago in Texas, I stated I thought this, this should be another investigation, not reopen the same commission, but another investigation. Some people say it will be terrible on the Kennedys at will, but that family has already lain three or four gifted brothers as on the altar of their country as human sacrifices. I think we owe it to our 213 million people, to them and to the world, to dig wherever the facts will lead us. I have no special theory of what happened, but I think we should go wherever the facts lead us and find out what they are and enter this with no predetermined conclusion as to how it happened, who encouraged it, or what happened. Right. Thank, Thank you, you. We'll be right back. With me now is Dick Gregory, the comedian and social activist who, as far as I am concerned, uh, started this whole thing. He came to me and, uh, and discussed the evidence of the Zapruder film and of uh, the president's death uh, and got me involved, and that's why we did the segment on the last program, and it's the result of the response to that program that caused us to devote the entire 90 minutes this time to the show, uh, or rather to the... Uh, to the murder of the president. And I wonder what response you've gotten since then. I'm so tickled to be here tonight, thanks to Joliet Junior College in Illinois to switch the date for me. I think, after looking at this show tonight, that any investigation that's held, it is almost a must 
that the whole taping of this show tonight, if they have to subpoena it, should be brought in. I'll give it to them voluntarily. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, the reaction has just been unbelievable. The tremendous amount of people that was able to see with their own eyes, to sit and talk and discuss is one thing. To see with your own eyes is something else. And I think this will do more to have an investigation so we can clear the air. There's a lot of questions that have to be asked. We heard tonight of the Secret Service uh, do a good job. Lee Harvey Oswell never bragged about killing someone. He didn't have to. The fact that he said, I don't want to be an American citizen. I'm going to Russia. I'm going to give secrets away. The fact that that man is back in the country mean that some investigative force who have the, the protection not only of the president but of America should have known where he was at that time. And I think what's beginning to come out now, and I think, you know, the people that was able to see the first show and the ones that were able to see this show now, regardless to what side of the fence you on, will be able to say there's a lot that's been left to the imagination that something could have happened wrong. Let's solve it. You know, we talk about uh, valuable documents that's stored away for 25 years. Uh, the president is bigger than his family. He's bigger than his wife. He's bigger than his kids. He was our president. And anything happened negatively, to affect that president affects all Americans. There were many people that committed suicide, many people that, that had heart attacks. And if any information that would throw any light on what happened, be it negative or positive, should be released. And I would hope that this show and shows like this and the news media, I think the salvation of this country today lies with the news media going in saying, we're going to ask some hardcore questions. We're going to do some hardcore investigation. And to the extent where the Congress, where, where people in power making position, is going to have to scream out for the type of investigation that we're going to need. I know that at the end of your college lectures, you, uh, you have kind of a rap session with the audience, and you ask them what they think about what they've seen and heard. I think that uh, that would certainly be a valid exercise here tonight, and I wish you would lead the question. Sure. Pleasure. I sincerely hope that we haven't, uh, that by our questions and the tone of our questions, we're not making people who might support the Warren Commission afraid to raise their hands. I want to know how many people here feel that Lee Harvey Oswald, and please answer honestly, was the lone assassin? Okay. Two, three. Three people. How many people feel that Lee Harvey Oswald was acting in concert with at least one other person. Okay. How many people feel that Lee Harvey Oswald was a participant in a grand conspiracy, grand only in its scope and dimension? Does anyone here feel that he wasn't involved? One. Uh, I have one final uh, question, really, and I think it's the key question. How many people here would like to see this case reopened? How many people would not like to see it reopened? One. I think that uh, that's the central point. Dick, thank you for coming. Thank on. you, brother. So much. Peace be with you. Thank you. In studying the circumstances surrounding the death of President Kennedy, the phrase, if only, frequently comes to mind. If only they hadn't taken that trip to Dallas. If only their motorcade had avoided Dealey Plaza. If only the assassin's aim had betrayed him at the moment of murder. If only, if only. It's a phrase born of frustration that also applies to what happened after Kennedy was killed. If only the doctors at Parkland Hospital in Dallas had been permitted the time to perform a proper autopsy. If only Jack Ruby had spared Lee Oswald. If only Oswald had confessed. 
If only the Warren Commission didn't appear to be just a well-motivated attempt to close the terrible wound the nation had suffered. I think that by now time has healed that wound. Long ago we passed the point where the truth might have been too unbearable. Now it's just the absence of truth that bothers us. Rational men and women are raising reasonable questions. With all due respect to the honorable members of the Warren Commission and their hardworking staff, I submit that their carefully manicured account of what happened on the 22nd day of November 1963 just doesn't hold up under the test of time. If Lee Harvey Oswald was one of the trigger men, then the physical evidence suggests that he wasn't the only one. To pretend any longer that we're satisfied with the official version of history is to compound the cruel loss we suffered when John Kennedy was killed. A high-level, nonpartisan, objective, congressional inquiry weighing every shred of relevant evidence is the only way we can finally and honorably let John Kennedy rest in peace. Peace to you all. Good night. I still can see him smiling there and waving at the crowd as he drove through the music of the band and never even knowing no more time would be allowed not for the president and not for the man that was the president and that was the man.